What that then means is that if you understand some of the basic theory that underpins force analysis, you can get an awful lot of information by just standing on a force plate and then move, you know, and performing some simple movements. And we, you, you know, and we tend to get that by studying and deconstructing the force time curve. And so if, let me just play this video for you. So if you watch this here, what we've got is, is our guy on the left here standing on a force plate and simultaneously this high speed video footage recording his performance. And all he's going to do is, provide, is perform a body weight squat. And you can see initially as he's standing still, the force plate is acting like the bar from scale. So it's just displaying his weight, which is around 800 newtons or around sort of 78, 79 kilograms if you convert it to SI units. And what you'll see is, and this is what I find really useful for people to understand, is that at this particular point in time, look, our force has an initial decrease, but then, and while our athlete is still squatting down, starts to increase, continues to increase until it gets to a peak, after which our athlete then starts to reverse that downward movement and pushes against the ground to stand himself back up. And so this I find really useful because what it's essentially showing us is that the force time curve isn't always as intuitive as perhaps we think it is. And what I mean by that is this doesn't necessarily mean that our jumper is moving down, or sorry, our squatter is moving downwards. Likewise, an increase in force doesn't necessarily mean that our squatter is moving upwards. So what we have to understand is that what this force time curve shows us is essentially a reflection of the acceleration of our athlete. So whether he's, his, his movement is speeding up or slowing down, and it also gives us an indication of the direction he's moving in. And I'll take you through that in a bit more detail in a moment. That's a relatively simple movement. So if you can get your head around or start understanding the interaction between the movement that athletes performing and the shape of the force time curve, that can be really useful. And then if we move on to a slightly more complicated movement, we have this guy here performing a counter movement jump, which many of you either will do or, or, or probably have used in the past or perhaps performed. Again, what you can see down here is at the moment, the force plate is acting like a bar from scale. It's giving us our jumper's weight. Now, this is really nice because the slow motion enables us to see that as the hips, knees and ankles start to flex, and as our athlete is accelerating towards the ground without applying any concentric or eccentric forces, he weighs less for this period of time. Then as he starts to retard his downward movement, you can see that that force increases. So we've got some positive acceleration, but the movement direction is still negative. Then as we get to this point here, we get a little bump in the force time curve as he swings his arms and he gradually becomes less and less heavy. So he essentially unweights as he eventually leaves the ground at this point here. You can see he's in flight now, got a pretty decent jump on him. And then the end of the jump will be marked by a really sharp increase in force as first the toes hit the ground and then the heel. And so all of his weight lands on that force platform. And this simple test, and it really is simple, gives us an opportunity to actually get a, a much better understanding of what our athlete or what your athletes are able to do in terms of their neuromuscular capacity. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean with that in a moment. But essentially, what we ideally want to try and do is to take a force time curve that looks like this, and deconstruct it like this. I mean, come on, who doesn't get excited when they see something like this? All we've done here, though, <laughs> is we've used... Me. I mean, I, I'm excited. <clears throat> so all I've done here is I've used Newton's laws of motion. So the understand... I mean, we all know the force equals mass times acceleration, and I'm going to touch on that in a moment. But we can use that relationship to start getting more information from my force time data. So what I've done is I've done some relatively simple calculations here. And you can see that the red curve, the red squiggly line, is our force data from a counter movement jump like the one you've just seen and the yellow line the yellow squiggly line is our velocity data so how quickly our jumper is moving and the direction that they're moving in and so we can use this to deconstruct that force time curve and so you can see that a is essentially where the jump starts between points a 
and b we've got a negative acceleration and we know it's a negative acceleration because the velocity is decreasing we also know that the jumper is moving in a negative direction and we know this because the velocity data here is below zero okay between b and c this is essentially where the jumper starts to put on the brakes now there's been some great research recently as um, by some guys john harry and his colleagues who have shown that actually part of the eccentric phase, uh, eccentric phase may actually start here but traditionally we'll we'll associate b as the start of what we typically call the eccentric phase and that might be a little bit misleading but it, it's kind of good from a general perspective and what we see here is that essentially the athletes putting on the brakes they're starting to speed up so we've got a positive it was a positive acceleration okay because it's an increase in that velocity time curve, but we're still moving in a negative direction. C marks that lowest squat position. So it's at this point here, this is our transition from down to upward movement. So again, we've got positive acceleration because the slope of the velocity time curve is increasing. But now we know that because it's above zero, we have got a positive direction as well. So that jumper is now pushing against the ground and moving to this point here, point E, where he leaves the ground. We then have a brief period between D and E where we've still got some positive movement. The jumper is still moving upwards before he leaves the ground, but we've got some negative acceleration as we see the slope of the velocity time curve starts to decrease. And that's pretty much forms the basis of any kind of analysis that we might, might want to do because from this, we can calculate all sorts of different types of variables. We can calculate it for the whole of the contact phase from A to E, or we can calculate it for the unweighting, the braking eccentric phase, the propulsion phase, or indeed all of the, the concentric phase. And I'll go on to a little bit more in a, a little bit more detail in a moment about how you might wanna, or how you can most effectively start thinking about what variables you might want to look at. But that's really straightforward. And we do all of this using these. And I won't dwell on this too much, but anybody who's followed my Twitter account will have probably seen it up there, up there at some point. And you can always get in touch with me and, and you know, email me or, or get hold of me via Twitter and I'm more than happy to pass this on. This is a relatively, um, I'm going to say idiot proof. The reason I say idiot proof is because I've developed it for my first year sports science students. <laughs> and, I, and I think most of them get it. Now, that isn't meant to sound as patronising as it probably did. But what I mean is that actually, if you're, if you're, look, every object, whether it's an individual or a sporting implement, will have inertia. If it's moving, okay, then it's defined by its mass. Oh, sorry, if it's not moving, it's defined by its mass. But if it's moving, it's defined by its momentum. And we know that momentum is directly proportional to the impulse that we apply. And all the impulse is, is force multiplied by the change in time. So how hard you push or pull something and how long you push or pull it for. And they're two really useful qualities, free if you include the velocity component of velocity, uh, sorry, of momentum, three really useful elements for assessing someone's neuromuscular capacity, okay? The harder you push, the longer you push for, the greater your impulse will be, and as a consequence, the faster you'll move. But of course, most sports are typically constrained by time. So we ideally want our athletes to be able to apply as much force as they possibly can in a shorter period as they possibly can. So they're moving as fast as they can, whether that's to actually evade um, op an op opposition player or whatever. Very, very rarely are your athletes afforded the opportunity to take as long as they possibly can to apply force. So impulse for me is a really important metric. <laughs> Excuse me. Anything, any area, but around the force time curve so here for example or here the area under the force time curve that's the impulse is how hard